Telharmonium service to the Café Martin on Madison Square was inaugurated in November 1906. The foyer of this elegant Parisian establishment attracted ladies who, <clears throat> for professional reasons, seldom disdained invitations to an evening's diversion. <laughs> At first, the F-sharps from the Telharmonium blared shrilly. A defective diaphragm was quickly replaced, and it seemed to the delighted patrons that clearly here was an instrument that would purvey music to the million. After the cafe's inaugural dinner, the honored guests repaired to Telharmonic Hall. Here, they were treated to a demonstration of the singing arc. Two arc lamps connected directly to the Telharmonium. As they glowed with light, the lamps acted as small loudspeakers, oscillating with music. Early in December, Mark Twain visited Telharmonic Hall. Every time I see or hear a new wonder like this, I have to postpone my death right off. I couldn't possibly leave the world until I've heard this again and again. Just after New Year's Day, the New York Electric Music Company connected the Telharmonium to the massive, ornate, and ostentatious Casino Theater. The casino was a luxurious temple for fluffy and frolicsome musical productions. It was the primary gathering place where privileged young men could survey a showcase of feminine bloom. For an hour before the curtain rose on the huge chorus, the pretty and shapely women, and the bubbling gaiety, audiences were delighted with the telharmonium. The electrical music was piped into the gilded lobby, before the musical comedies and during the intermissions. Sweet, round and music. Great, penetrating power. In January 1907, Telharmonic Hall finally announced that concerts would be open to the public. A long list of distinguished guests attended the gala formal reception. Present were composer Victor Herbert, Banker Spencer Trask, financier George Foster Peabody, conductor Walter Damrush, playwright Clyde Fitch, and inventor Peter Cooper Hewitt. Crosby grandly announced that the Hotel Normandy on Broadway and 38th Street and the magnificent Waldorf Astoria on 5th Avenue and 33rd had just subscribed to his telharmonic service. Clear, sweet, perfect tones. Clear, sustained, perfect tones. Inside Telharmonic Hall, music played from horns hidden in the circular divan the ceiling, ferns and shrubs, columns and urns. The prestigious Elliot Shank was named the new music director and replaced the little-known and expendable Edwin Hall Pierce. With nine pieces at each of four daily concerts, it became difficult for the musicians to find enough time to practice, and it wasn't long before the quality of performances became inconsistent. Meanwhile, Thaddeus Cahill plodded on in Holyoke working on improvements. February 1907 was the heyday of the Telharmonium. At the unveiling, critics had noted that Telharmonic music was deficient. Rather crude and lacking in variety, also certain tones are over-accented. Yet, in the space of a few weeks, it had become a popular novelty, and hundreds filled Telharmonic Hall for each concert. The New York newspapers daily carried glowing reports. The hall featured exciting demonstrations of tone building, the sounds of the different acoustic instruments as they were built up from scratch. Vocalists sang and a violinist played along with the instrument in the hall, but at first only the keyboard music was transmitted over the wires. After a few weeks, Broadway singer Isabel Winlock was hired to record gramophone records for the telephone transmission of vocals along with the telharmonium. 
or blend of woodwind and brass with a peculiar twang of zone. Many of the new hotels purchased the service: the Victoria on Broadway and 27th, and the Imperial on Broadway and 31st, among them. The latter was the site of the Great Telharmonic Lenten Revival Service, led by the Reverend Henry Marsh Warren. As the good preacher announced the hymns in the hotel meeting room, the performer at Telharmonic Hall was cued to begin by telephone. At a simultaneous service at Telharmonic Hall, the hymns were sung and transmitted to the subscribing hotels. When the musical redeemer comes, he will be able, by means of the telharmonic system, to draw unimaginable harmonies from the caves of sound. Lee DeForest was an ambitious young inventor who had been experimenting with radio transmissions for six years. He had just invented the three-element vacuum tube, the triode or audion. In February 1907. He persuaded a skeptical Oscar T. Crosby to let him broadcast the telharmonium. He set up his radio receiver on the roof of the Yale Club, an 11-story building on 44th Street. The electrical music would come through the air, but so would interference in the form of Morse code from steamships in the harbor. Next, DeForest put his apparatus on the top floor of the Times Tower, a skyscraper on 43rd Street. But accompanying the music were radio telegraph signals from the Brooklyn Navy Yard and as far away as Bridgeport, Connecticut. DeForest continued broadcasting from Telharmonic Hall for several months, but static dropouts and frying noises made reception undependable. DeForest nevertheless tried to pedal his system to the New York Electric Music Company, but Crosby declined. In April, the Hall announced the end of its first season. The final program was a multi-channel extravaganza featuring different sounds from various locations in the auditorium. Portable volume controls were carried through the audience, and the enchanted patrons were invited to operate them. A sensitive to moods and emotions as a living thing. Motion pictures demonstrated to potential subscribers how to request musical selections by telephone. After the hall closed, the New York City Board of Estimate offered a cable franchise to Crosby for a hefty six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. By the fall of 1907, it had become obvious to Oscar T. Crosby that the telharmonium would never eliminate traditional instruments and the salaries of those who played them. Rather than throw any more money or time at this white elephant of music, he decided to take his losses and abandon the telharmonium. <laughs> Meanwhile, economic troubles were beginning to fester nationwide. Stock prices fell when the rigid money supply didn't grow with the roaring economy. Soon, commodity prices collapsed. In October. The Knickerbocker Trust Company failed when it was discovered that its directors were loaning the bank's money to themselves. Other banks tumbled in rapid succession, and the panic of 1907 was on. The stock market lost most of its value, and currency was being sold at a premium. Businesses went bankrupt, and 80 percent of the Broadway shows closed. During the panic. Crosby's junior partner Frederick C. Todd took the helm of the New York Electric Music Company. While depositors were withdrawing their money from banks, he formed a new corporation to lure fresh investors and prepared to supply electrical music along Broadway once again. <laughs> 